very intuitive, but not really evidence-based. So based on <clears throat> that expert opinion, um, the recommendations in 2000 was breastfeeding for the first year and then introducing the foods, much like Zeiger did in his study, uh, milk at age one, egg at age two, and then peanuts, nuts, and seafood at age three or older. <clears throat> and that's what we all recommended. You know, when I was a fellow, when I started out in practice, this was what allergists, family doctors, pediatricians, everyone recommended. So what do you think was the outcome of that recommendation? Did we prevent peanut allergy? Did we prevent food allergy? Well, um, Dr. Boyce already showed you some slides on the U.S. data where we found that after the year 2000 when these recommendations were promulgated, in the United States, peanut allergy prevalence tripled. What about the rest of the world? Well, UK had very similar recommendations in 1998. In the UK, peanut allergy increased. What about <clears throat> Australia, where, again, the same recommendations were given? Increase. Canada, increase. So if anything, dietary restrictions would apparently have led to more allergy. Well, how is that possible, right? So there are now studies that seem to indicate that early consumption causes less allergy, maybe delayed uh, introduction causes more allergy. So um, when you go to the rest of the world, outside of US, Canada, UK, and Australia, if you go to Asia, Africa, I mean, there are no dietary restrictions in Africa. I mean, there, you know, there's no epidemic of peanut allergy there. The epidemic is malnutrition. So infants there eat everything. If you go to Asia, Japan, um, China, the Middle East, you know, the rates, the prevalence of food allergies and peanut allergy are lower than what we have here. What's different is that the babies there actually eat peanut at a very early age. So this um, observational study was done um, from the UK, Dutoit et al. This is an interesting study where they looked specifically at this phenomenon of uh, early introduction to peanut and its effect on peanut allergy. So they looked at um, children in Israel, and they had a comparable um, matched uh, group in uh, London where they looked at Jewish children in uh, England and compared the rates of peanut allergy prevalence. And in the UK, uh, in Jewish children, the prevalence rate was 1.85%. And in uh, Israeli school children, the prevalence rate was 0.17%. That's a tenfold difference. And you know they accounted for differences in ethnicity, culture, um, genetics, socioeconomic class. The main difference is that Israeli children start eating peanut at four months of age. Okay, there's a very popular snack called bamba, which can, is made with it's like peanut butter uh, and corn puffs. So infants four to six months of age start eating peanut in uh, Israel. Um, when they looked at the median consumption of peanut per month in Israeli uh, children, seven grams a month. When you looked at the median consumption of Jewish uh, children in uh, UK, where they're following their pediatrician's recommendations, median consumption of peanut, zero. All right, so this study seemed to indicate that perhaps uh, delaying the uh, introduction of peanut might actually result in a higher risk of peanut allergy. Um, this study by Joseph is a uh, birth cohort study from uh, Detroit, where they looked at <clears throat> Um, uh, uh, patients and how early they started eating uh, solid foods. And they found that when uh, peanut and also egg were introduced at age four to six months, there was much less peanut and egg allergy than if the peanut and egg were introduced after that age. Very interesting. This is a study on milk and how early milk is introduced and what happens to milk allergy. This is a study from Israel. And they found that, uh, again, a birth cohort study, if uh, cow's milk protein or milk was introduced by age two weeks of life, 
the prevalence was 0.05%. But in children who had milk, cow's milk protein introduced uh, at 28 uh, to 50 uh, weeks of life, you had a prevalence rate of 1.85. So again, it seemed like very early introduction to cow's milk led to less cow's milk allergy. Um, this study is from Australia, looking at specifically uh, egg. And these are actually uh, egg uh, allergy uh, documented with uh, food challenges. And they looked at the age of introduction to egg. So in the uh, non-allergic uh, patients to egg, egg was introduced uh, at four to six months of age. And in all the ones who uh, had egg allergy documented by egg challenges, and this is over 300 egg allergic children, they had egg introduced much later. And finally, a study looking at introduction of wheat. This is from National Jewish Hospital. Uh, again, a birth cohort study. And they found that, uh, again, 16% of, you know, they, they found actually um, uh, a, a number of wheat allergic patients, and they found that if wheat was introduced earlier than six months, there was no wheat allergy. Wheat introduced after age six months was the high risk for wheat allergy. So these studies seem to indicate a paradigm shift in how we approach the advice concerning when to give foods. Foods given earlier seem to result in less food allergy. Foods given later seem to have a higher risk of developing allergy. So it brings to bear the issue of tolerance. OK, I'm getting a, so, um, so the current recommendations then are that breastfeeding should be done for the first four to six months. Uh, there is no evidence that the introduction of foods uh, should be delayed beyond four to six months. And these are from the uh, revised recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the uh, guidelines from the NIAID. But this doesn't really answer Mrs. Smith's question, like exactly when do I give Johnny peanut butter? You know, is it six months? Is it 12 months? Is it, you know? So, um, and no one is willing to come out and state anything. So I did find this uh, dietary sequence. It was just published last month in the clinics, immunology clinics. And they do give a sequence where, again, breastfeeding four to six months of age. Uh, if you're unable to breastfeed, you can use hydrolysates, uh, which are less allergenic. And when you introduce solid foods, start with vegetables, yellow, orange, green vegetables, cereals and grains, then meats, and, and just advance the diet accordingly. For highly allergenic foods, um, these can be introduced once these less allergenic foods are tolerated in this sequence. And the exceptions would be if you develop immediate type hypersensitive reactions to any of these foods, or if the child develops moderate to severe eczema, or a sibling of a child with peanut allergy, there is a 7% risk of a sibling who has uh, peanut allergy. So that uh, situation, those situations might warrant allergy consultation. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, so now uh, the baby's a little older. <laughs> um, this is a different child, though. Three-year-old with atopic dermatitis who presents for evaluation. And his parents want to know if foods are causing his atopic dermatitis. Uh, currently, his skincare regimen is over-the-counter hydrocortisone every few weeks. Uh, the family's concerned about steroid side effects, so they're really trying to limit the amount of topical steroids they put on and they're doing emollients every few days. The other thing that you find in the history is that he had hives with peanut butter ingestion, but he eats all other foods without any reaction. So uh, let's look at the guidelines and see what we should do uh, for him. So I, I will say that this was a guideline that uh, caused a tremendous amount of discussion. It was probably one of the most contentious um, but I think that it turned out uh, uh, excellent. Um, I think it has very good advice, and the expert panel suggests that children less than five years old with moderate to severe AD be considered for food allergy evaluation for milk, egg, peanut, wheat, and soy if at least 
one of the following conditions is met. First, the child has persistent AD in spite of optimized management and topical ther therapy. So the, the idea is you treat the skin first. The second reason that you would consider doing food allergy testing is if the patient has a reliable history of an immediate reaction after ingesting the food. So the rationale by the panel was that in spite of the lack of evidence, the opinion is that if the child is less than five years of old and has a persistent AD, there's benefit to finding out if an allergy is contributing to the atopic dermatitis symptoms. Um, now you'll note that the expert panel is only addressing children less than five years of age, and that's because the feeling was that, um, this, that older children and adults are unlikely to have food as an uh, ongoing trigger for atopic dermatitis. So the other thing that's uh, in the guideline, they talk about the balance of benefits and harms. Um, and so certainly early diagnosis can be helpful. However, uh, testing is time consuming and costly for patients and their families. In addition, uh, severely restrictive diets may be harmful. And I, I have to say that, you know, 20 years ago when I first started taking care of patients with atopic dermatitis, um, I really it took me, like, it was very, very hard to convince anyone that the food might be a problem. And this would be the patients with very severe disease. But now, we, patients come in and they're on very, very restricted diets. They've had, you know, sort of massive testing for every food. And because they have high IgE levels and they have atopic dermatitis, they have a lot of false positives. So the guideline is really trying to say you, you need to be careful um, about the testing. And you also need to be careful that even that the child is truly allergic before you restrict their diet. Now, um, unfortunately, the quality of evidence is low. Um, and what, what that means is that future studies could have a significant impact uh, on these recommendations. Uh, and the contribution of the expert panel, which did include allergists, dermatologists, and a lot of people who take care of AD, was significant. Um, so I will say, though, that I think that sort of since this uh, guideline, there has been a study published um, that supports this. Um, so what should we do? So we should um, optimize the skincare regimen, um, daily baths, emollients at least twice a day, and you know, review with the family that using a low potency topical steroid for seven to 10 days won't cause significant side effects teach them how to look for side effects, um, and then we can get his skin cleared. Um, however, as you recall, he did have a, re uh, a history of an acute reaction to peanut, so testing him for peanut, um, either skin testing or specific IgE testing would be appropriate. Now we'll move on to another common question that arises that the guidelines also had to um, address. Uh, and this is a question of a six-year-old girl with egg allergy and asthma, and what should be done about the influenza vaccine. So her history is that she had egg allergy diagnosed at 18 months. Um, she did have a recent accidental ingestion of egg in a chewy candy that caused um, anaphylaxis with hives and vomiting, coughing. But she was also admitted last fall with an asthma exacerbation. So first, let's look at the, what the guidelines say. Um, and so the expert panel concludes that insufficient evidence exists to recommend administering influenza vaccine, either inactivated or live attenuated to patients with a history of severe reactions to egg proteins. Less severe or local manifestations of allergy to egg or feathers are not contraindications. However, um, so the, you know, the expert panel was saying you, you, you know, can't, they can't recommend giving it. However, they recognized that it was common among the patients who would really benefit from influenza vaccine. And these are, these are patients like the young girl I described, children and adults, um, as well as anyone with asthma. So the, the issue is the guidelines were written at a time when this field was actually advancing quickly. Uh, we had published a small study uh, looking at the safety of giving influenza vaccine to children with egg allergy. Um, 
And I really have to give Marshall Plout and Matthew Fenton a lot of credit because they really sort of wrote the guideline to make it a, a little hazy, even though at the time they couldn't come out and recommend it. Um, but because of, of the studies that were being done, um, the guidelines really are out of date. Um, since then, there have been seven published studies with over 1,600 egg allergic children, including 185 children with egg anaphylaxis. All of these studies showing safety of administration. Um, the studies had low reaction rates uh, between 0 and 6 percent, and the reactions were mild, um, mainly skin reactions. Uh, but the other really important thing that happened is that uh, a couple of studies measured the amount of egg protein content in the vaccines and found that it was very low. Uh, and in addition, over the last couple of years, the manufacturers have been more forthcoming about the measurement of the egg protein in the vaccines. So I think the, you, the guidelines, although they provide a good background, they really are out of date in this regard and a, and a better up-to-date um, review of this would be a practice paper um, update on egg allergy and influenza vaccine that was published on the Quad AI, Quad AI website in November 2011. <coughs> um, and this says that influenza vaccine can be administered as a single dose to egg allergic patients. If they've had hives only, you could do it in the primary care office. If they've had anaphylaxis or a severe reaction, you want to have um, consider giving in an allergist office where treatment of anaphylaxis is, uh, where they have good knowledge of treatment of anaphylaxis. Um, you, in addition, you want to observe for 30 minutes and wherever, whatever setting should have proper resuscitative equipment to manage anaphylaxis. So, and I, I just wanted to just sort of mention briefly what we do, which is a little different. Um, just because we've been sort of studying this over several years, so we've kind of evolved uh, something that we found that's, that's helpful. So what we've recommended the last three years is a single dose in the primary care office um, for patients with non-anaphylactic egg reactions. And then also if children have received the vaccine in our program, and some of them have, have received them now for multiple years, then we feel comfortable with them having the vaccine in their pediatrician's office. And we also felt comfortable with children who are eating eggs, baked eggs regularly, that meaning every day they're having something with baked eggs. Um, the, the Quad AI guidelines are stay away from this because they recognize that patients who are eating baked eggs can sometimes have egg anaphylaxis. Um, but this is something that, that's worked well in our program. Um, we do see patients uh, in the allergy program and we usually will give them a single dose or sometimes one-tenth, nine-tenths dose. Uh, patients who've had egg anaphylaxis and then we, we have, as I said, there's a, in, in our um, series is about a 3% reaction rate, mainly mild skin reactions, occasional coughing. And I uh, have to say that we're never really sure if it's the flu vaccine or something they came in contact in the waiting room when they were waiting. Um, but we will give those patients in the vaccine in our program. We won't send them to the pediatrician's office. Um, and of course, every, any place, you know, we emphasize you need proper resuscitative equipment. We observe for 30 minutes, and we also make sure that the patients have their EpiPens with them before they leave, just, just to be on the safe side. Um, so our little child, what should we do? So yes, we should give her the influenza vaccine. Um, it was given in our office, she was monitored for 30 minutes, and she had no reaction, and we felt good knowing that she was protected from influenza. And so I'll turn it on, turn it over to Wayne now. Thank you, Linda. So it's a pleasure, thanks to Chris and the uh, Asthma Center for inviting me to join this uh, panel. Um, and I always cringe a little bit when I'm introduced as a food allergist. I like to think of myself as an allergist who studies food allergy, but at some point you just go with it. And, uh, and Josh's uh, point about um, the significance of him as a non-food allergist um, uh, leading the expert panel is a really good one. I think it was a, one of the best decisions NIAD made in that whole process. Um, and it does really, I think, 
uh, help underscore um, the tremendous need for ongoing research in many of these uh, areas to address more questions. So Josh 